no, 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 yeah, 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 but uh, do, don't worry. This is this is oh, for the oh, other. This, so, is, this yeah. is for the other. You can see your slides there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then here you have this is yeah. the yeah. this is the remote. Yeah. And I think the more or less we are ready. Okay. Vamos. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, welcome everyone and good morning. I am Sandro Meloni and I'm with Alberto Antonioni. I'm the chair of the program committee of the conference. So if you have any complaints about the program, uh, please talk to Alberto. Uh, and also I have the honor of chairing this plenary, this plenary session in this, in this morning. And today we are going to start talking about uh, biological complexity. And actually, we have the honor of having here Professor uh, Pauline Hockeberg. That's okay. More, more or less. More or less okay. More or less okay. <laughs> As the first keynote speaker of, um, of the day, Professor Hockeberg is honorary professor at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And also, she's one of the most prominent uh, scientists in biocomplexity, and in particular in the in um, in the study of dynamical information processing in uh, biotic systems. Actually, uh, we can say that actually she started the field in the 70s when with Ben Esper, she, she defined, she coined the term bio, bioinformatics. And since then she has been the, one of the leading voices in the, in the field. So it's a great honor for us having her here today. And the, the title of her talk is Evolution of Biological Complexity from Special Cases to General Insights. And thank you again, Pauline, for, for being here. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's uh, very nice conference, very nice place. Uh, secondly, I want to thank my uh, collaborators um, that are here on the slides. That's actually, I only listed those that are very, very particularly in involved with the examples that I will be talking about. Third, I want to apologize for my slides. My uh, laptop broke down, so I didn't have the last check on if, if everything was in the right place and so on. So when my slides are messy, well, my apologies, but I hope you can still see what I'm going to do. Well, when we talk about evolution of biological complexity, these pictures on the bottom are actually to remind you what kind of complexity we are talking about when we are talking about the complexity of biological systems. So we have, um, well, the, the, the code of everything that's happening within an organism is in the DNA, and a single nucleotide change in the DNA can have its uh, effects on, uh, well, on the kind of animal that comes out. And so that is an upscaling of more than 10 orders of magnitude. So that's impressive, right? So we can have this, this sensitivity of the system to a single mutation. On the other hand, there are many, many single mutations which don't matter at all. And that's, so on the first way, it has to be able to upscale. This mapping um, from the genotype to the phenotype is, uh, well, has many levels, as this picture um, suggests, and is, of course, extremely nonlinear. Um, okay. This doesn't work. Oh, yeah. Now it did work. Okay, and so when we are talking about um, a biological evolution, well, it's uh, good to start with Darwin, of course. And uh, well, he had this this beautiful way of saying it is there is a grandeur in this view of life from some so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Um, of course, Darwin didn't know anything about this, um, um, this transition from a genotype to a phenotype. It was just not known at the time. So what he was thinking about 
is indeed, well, all these wonderful animals and plants that we have, and, um, well, his experiments in his, uh, his greenhouse. So, um, well, uh, but otherwise, I think this is early to what he is saying, but we also want to understand this uh, mapping. Um, for on the one hand, how did it come about? On the other hand, given this kind of mapping, what should we expect evolution to do? I didn't know anything about this. Nowadays we do. Nevertheless, most of um, theory about evolution is ignoring um, this, um, well, this large transition, largely. So, um, well, I'm um, going to, to focus on this in, well, internal organization, you can say, and um, well, try to, I won't go from DNA to an elephant, but I hope to get some little steps in that direction. Okay, so, but now the next question is, well, how did this come about? All this, uh, well, this, this kind of mapping, and how can we model it? In, uh, in time and in space. So, uh, well, the space that they occupy. Um, then, well, that's the space is, is implying that already. Uh, we mostly use models where our individuals are embedded in space. Um, this allows, um, well, the spatial pattern formation and therewith what kind of interactions happen, which therewith involves what actually is the fitness which is evolving. So, well, in the non-supervised approach, we also try to avoid to have an external fitness criterion. Um, and so we are trying to model what um, Darwin called uh, natural selection as opposed to artificial selection as uh, well all the breeding programs that he was very well aware of. Okay, and then last but not least, exploit self-organization, which can happen um, the um, um, and well, which is a, a way to say an emergent of complexity and the feedback of that complexity on the primary entities which are modeled um, so that we have first and second order emergence. 
Well, when we take this somewhat more complex or structured uh, entities that most uh, um, uh, people are um, using, um, uh, this means that we have to be kind of special. However, uh, we want to get to a general theory. And um, so, um, well, I'll try to show you that when we see a convergence of certain phenomena in quite structurally different uh, models, well, this gives us uh, an idea about generality, which is a different idea about generality than having one model which shows for all cases what that this is happening. Okay. Is what I want.
So when this evolves, it's uh, clearly this, uh, the uh, system gets a little bit more complex. So it is one of the questions in how uh, complexity evolves. The two, uh, the two outcomes after a very, very long transient, when we did this work a number of years ago, two weeks, uh, on, on our computers to, to just have one of these evolutionary runs, millions and millions of time steps. Um, um, then we, so we see this is a symmetry that I was just uh, talking about, uh, but in a little bit different form. But nevertheless, the, the primary point is this asymmetry. Okay, so the question now, as I said, is why? And I'll, um, it's, it's true in both systems. However, it is much easier to demonstrate in the cell-based system. So uh, what we have here is this established cell-based uh, cell, um, uh, cell system, um, uh, where in the middle, is, uh, which has a circle around it, these cells, some of the cells just by accident have lost their DNA. I mean, the just a few uh, molecules of that in a, in a rather small cell. So that that happens because of stochasticity. So we are back to an RNA world within the cell. Um, well, and what you see if, is that when that happens, this um, clump, well, uh, the, the picture shows a clump of cells just has to happen in one cell, um, that grows out. So that means that these RNA-based cells are actually more fit. Um, so, so they outcompete the cells with DNA in it. However, if you keep going, then after a while, this um, bunch of cells uh, loses out on everybody else. So the system re-establish itself as this DNA-based system I just explained. Okay, so what this shows is that having DNA-based cells actually is, as you could expect a priori, um, on a small uh, time scale, disadvantageous. However, as we see here, on the longer time scale, it is advantageous. Well, one of the um, taboos in uh, biology, um, also um, voiced by uh, Sat Marie and uh, Maynard Smith, when they talked about the major transitions in evolution, where this DNA is one of them, say, okay, we are committed to this um, well, postulate, or, or what we all uh, try to do, is to say we can only give explanations in terms of immediate benefits. And so what we see here is that there's not immediate benefits, but these long-term evolutionary processes. So what this shows, um, sorry, uh, what this shows is that it's not for immediate benefit, but actually for evolutionary reasons that this happens. And so the reason when we look at that a bit, bit further is that only strong catalysis is being maintained in the system when there is also DNA. I showed you that in the RNA world, there is this tendency for getting less and less catalysis because of the well of the altruism that that uh, implies dna has this this push but not or much less and everybody well the common ancestor of all the molecules is actually in this system the dna so it is a kind of um, um uh, protection uh, against this pro uh, this well, diminishing of the functionality. Okay, so that's nice. That's within, well, two models actually because of the spatial embedding and the cells. But you can also ask the question the other way around. That's to say, okay, we don't, don't start in an RNA-based based system, but in a system where we have these two types of molecules, which have an entirely symmetric um, interaction structure what will happen then and it, well and because well this was studied it is now being studied also in space but the the, the published work is uh, published uh, is is studied in a priori um, defined cells in a bit different way than before um there's are two parameters that's to say 
the volume of the cell and the mutation rate, which determine what happens, but on the um, hardest conditions, that is to say, with high mut mutation rates and a high volume, that's to say uh, that the two selection pressures on the cells and on the molecules, um, well, are um, well, uh, more or less out of balance. So when we don't have DNA, the system dies out in the upper right corner that we see here. Now we get this extreme division of labor that only one of the molecules does all the catalysis and all the information comes from the other one. So we have from these different sites in different models, we have this convergence of information starch. Um, and so it is clearly uh, um, effect of the multi-level nature that we have here. Um, and it happens when the selection on the cell level, which wants as much catalysis as possible, and on the molecular level, um, who have this tendency to decrease um, uh, um, catalysis, are when they are in more or less in balance or going to the molecules, then we get this larger complexity at the lower level. So we clearly have this, this feedback on a lower level of organization relative to the higher level. Well, the DNA mixed RNA mixed protein is known in biology as Crick's dogma, um, as something that, well, that is there, but we don't know why. And actually, when this uh, the last paper was being submitted, there was a referee who said, no, this is an, a chemical property. Well, what we show here, but, um, and, and Nobuto Takeuchi was the, the main uh, 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 worker here, um, is that Crick's dogma is actually a property of a multi-level evolutionary system where this uh, second level can be an emergent property. So Crick's dogma is now um, not the dogma anymore, but um, well, an uh, intrinsic, a generic property of an evolutionary process. Okay, and so we go to uh, my next example. Um, uh, and that is this eukaryogenesis, uh, which is another major step in an evolutionary process. Um, and so it is depicted here um, what happens, well, during uh, the formation of eukaryotes, and it took after a life um, emerged on, on Earth, it took, um, well, like two billion years before uh, eukaryotes came about, so it is really something that, that's not easy, so to say. And then we had this enormous expansion in the complexity of the cell structure and of the molecules which, which are there. And so why do we have this burst of complexity. And so what we know from phylogenetic analysis is that um, the eukaryotes, um, what we can trace is that, that uh, somewhere in this process, um, there was an endosymbiosis of an alpha proteobacteria in an archaea. Um, and um, well, that's what we know. And then we know this, this complexity. And the question is why, well, how important was this, um, this this point? And what's heavily discussed is did it well? Did the complexity happen because of this endosymbiosis, or could this endosymbiosis happen because we had already a lot of complexity? Um, uh, well, from phylogenetic analysis, the consensus becomes it was kind of intermediate between um, early and late, and uh, but nevertheless. Uh, what we want to know is, well, when we just take an endos uh, endosymbiosis uh, event where it is uh, obligatory for a cell to have um, this endosymbion to survive, does that trigger, in fact, um, the evolution of more complexity? Okay. Um, so... What we see, as I well, the, the previous picture uh, showed, is we have this enormous complex host, um, and um, actually the symbiont is getting a lot less complex, as we, for example, see in the size of the genomes of the host and the symbiont. We also see nowadays 
And so this, this endosymbiont became like mitochondria, which are the energy suppliers of, of our cells. Um, nowadays, there is an extensive control of the symbiont by the host in, in many, many different ways. Um, and well, the hypothesis that, that are about this, this well, uh, divergence of, of complexity is that it might be because of uh, energy requirements. When it is energy requirement, you, uh, requirements, you would expect that uh, complexity uh, only came after the uh, endosymbiosis because first this energy was not available uh, and also depends very much on uh, mutation rates because the small mitochondrial population uh, has a chance for a deterioration. Okay, so the questions that we are asking um, is actually, can we, expl by explicit modeling, uh, understand, uh, well, this, what I just said about the genome sizes particularly. So ignoring all kinds of other things, all the energy uh, uh, considerations, can we see this as, an, again, a generic process in multi-level evolution? Um, uh, and of course, um, as is true in all models, also in the previous one that I talked about, uh, we don't only want to go for these questions, we take the non-supervised uh, approach, although we have these, these questions in our, our mind, but also very much look at extra things that we can find. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. But let me first um, talk about the entities that uh, we are going uh, to be involved in this endosymbiosis. Um, so uh, what cells do is have a so-called cell cycle where different phases in, well, in the reproduction process and the growth process are uh, determined by um, different combinations of expression of genes. And so the, the, the start that we, we take here is to say, okay, let's take such an experimentally determined uh, network um, of Carobacter in this case, which goes uh, nicely through this cycle of these different states, which determine different phases in the cell cycle. Um, let's take that as a background and, well, have cells that, that, that do such a cell cycle. Um, well, uh, get involved in endosymbiosis and uh, what's happening there. But let's first look at what such a network is doing. One of the take home messages that I will get over is that um, for such networks, in, at least in biology, um, to see how they evolve, it is very important how they are coded for. So when we take networks, many people here are interested in networks. That's one of the why I am emphasizing this point. Are using a representation as a graph, or maybe just as as a, as a matrix um, in, in in such a form. When we look at such a biological regulatory network, it's of course coded on the genome, and that means that actually there are genes and there are a transcription factor binding sites, and when uh, well the correct transcription factors are bound there, the uh, gene is expressed or not expressed. And um, well, if it is expressed, then there is a, a, well, there's a connection when uh, one of these genes, uh, well, uh, functions as tra transcription factor for another gene. Why is this type of encoding important? Well, because the type of mutations that then can happen are different from the mutations that are normally uh, used in network theory. That's to say that you well, change a link from one thing or other, you break a link or something like that. Yeah, um, because in this way, because you have these transcription factor binding sites, which have a certain uh, signature, um, well, when uh, the signature of the transcription factor is changing somehow, this may not just uh, change one link, but change a whole lot of links. So you, you get this, well, this combined uh, thing. Moreover, um, so the kind of networks that evolve depend very much on this encoding. And we as biologists uh, well, like to do the encoding as we 
we find them in our system, but I think to think about this encoding. Okay, and so, as I said, these factors bind. Uh, this is certain probability uh, dependent on, in our case, a matching big, big string, but so it is also a matching in, in, in real work. Next thing that we um, include in our model is that in bacteria, uh, certainly, um, well, in everybody, but in bacteria, it gets very important, is that uh, the genome is being copied sequentially. So that means that part of the genome is copied at a certain moment, while another part of the genome is not yet copied. And so that means that you have a double representation uh, of part of the genome and not of the rest, which, of course, during this cell cycle um, is changing the at least the weights of the network. Yeah? And that's just a dynamic process during the cell cycle. Okay, and then so we start this with uh, to to in order to evolve uh, well these prokaryotic cells, we put them on a gradient of the amount of nutrients, and that means that this Boolean network that these people uh, um, proposed is of course not enough because it has to well when it has many nutrients, it can um, replicate the DNA faster. Then otherwise, and the cell cycle, which uh, organizes many other things, has to adapt to this nutrient level. And so that's what we evolve. Well, that evolves, and so it can invade indeed this gradient, as, as you see here. And well, from exactly the same uh, um, uh, initial conditions, the same uh, uh, model structure, with only a difference in the random generator that makes the mutations, we get different kinds of solutions. And so here are uh, some examples. The rightmost ones are the most successful ones who get the largest uh, population, have the largest genomes, in fact. So larger genome, although that takes longer uh, to replicate, um, is here necessary, well, is here what the fitness I mean, you get higher fitness when you get this property, which looks like uh, diminishing your fitness because it takes longer uh, to replicate. Okay, and then, well, these, these larger genomes we get in two uh, forms. Generalist, which has plasticity dependent on um, the nutrient conditions, and specialist, in which we get speciation within this gradient of uh, entities which are adapted to different levels. Okay, now the eukaryogenesis. Um, uh, oh no, I have one more thing about uh, these cell cycles. Um, so on the generalist and the specialist, and um, well, the one important other part is that this network and what it is doing is not understandable without looking at the genome level as well. So I said, what kind of network is evolving depends on this encoding in the genome, but because of this uh, sequential um, uh, replication, uh, what we see is that um, uh, the position of the different genes on the genome is extremely important. And what you see in these pink uh, lines in the, in the bottom picture is how important it is for that particular gene to be in that particular place. So when we randomize that particular gene only, you see that the fitness goes down enormously. So what people are studying as gene regulatory networks don't explain the behavior of that gene regulatory network. We have this interaction between these different levels. Okay, now we go to the eukaryogenesis. And so this is, uh, well, a picture in time. And so, of course, but we go from the same initial conditions. Um, what we show is that, yes, it adapts to the, the gradient, which is not so surprising, but we see that we get a large host genome and a small uh, endosymbiont genome, and that the number of endosymbionts or mitochondria is increasing over time. And so one of the outcomes um, is, uh, in this case, a gene regulatory network of the host, which is really enormous, and of the uh, symbiont below, um, that's much, much smaller and much more uh, simple. 
So the genome encoding and the network representation is here. Now, an important point is that not all replicants do the same thing. Uh, that's to say, uh, again, with true replicates, uh, what we find is that also the opposite can happen, that we have a large endosymbiont and a small host. So what do we do with such a, a thing? Well, we, we don't want to average then everybody is as, as big. And we also don't, so uh, circumstances are exactly the same. Well, it turns out that the first solution that I showed um, is, um, uh, is much more fit. So when you compete these two entities relative to each other, it's always the large host genome that wins. Okay, and actually, because of the interaction between the levels, we get an extra way to adapt uh, to the nutrient level uh, because, not because of host control, but because of the way that they react on different nutrient levels. They uh, actually compete for nutrients. Uh, and therefore we get a kind of equilibrium point, homeostasis of the amount of nutrients that they in fact get. And therefore, well, although the gradient has very different nutrient conditions, the cell experiences a homogeneous yeah, uh, situation. Okay, so again, what we see here, the outcomes of, um, well, uh, can, uh, can be quite different. However, when we look at a parallel with uh, biological processes, as we know them now, we see that a subset of true replicates are doing that. And well, uh, in this case, and in many cases, we see that that are actually the most um, well, the best outcomes. And of course, the biological systems that we see now, um, well, are the best outcomes. And again, it is the long-term um, uh, possibilities of these outcomes, uh, which are important. Okay, the last thing I want to go through very, very fast. So now we have a genome, uh, gene regulatory networks, as well as a metabolism. So now we are looking at, given this complex organization, what do we then expect that, um, uh, that evolution is doing? Here we take an external um, uh, fitness criterion, which I think is actually teaching, but makes a lot of observation a lot easier. Well, the main outcome is this. What we see, again, not in all cases, but in the best cases, is um, that we get this early enormous genome um, inflation, and that the fitness goes up much later. And as is shown in this picture, um, well, is again, that this inflation doesn't happen always, but happens in the best cases. And that while it happens, there's no difference between the fitness of those which happen to have it and those which happen not to have it. So it is a neutral thing when it happens. However, the ones who uh, get much, much later high fitness um, are the ones who actually had this in, uh, uh, genome inflation. I think, uh, and so having this very high dimensional uh, genome, yesterday there was somebody who's, who talked about the curse of dimensionality, and we often talk about the curse of dimensionality. I think for a evolutionary process, and we see that in many different contexts, the high dimensionality is actually very important. And so it starts up high dimensional, then it can adapt, and then it can reduce its genome. Okay, and indeed in biological systems, this is what we observe. A lot of adaptation happens, as we see from phylogenetic analysis, actually by loss of genes. And so just thinking back on this quote of, uh, from so simple a beginning to everything so wonderful. And um, so we see that, well, we, we started very simple. We got this um, genome inflation, so actually this common ancestors that we see now and that we can reconstruct by phylogenetic analysis were very complex, um, but the organisms weren't that complex yet. Yeah. Um, uh, and so this left uh, lower picture shows a particular example 
homeobox genes, which are important for the patterning of the body axis, and we see that amphioxus, which doesn't have a pattern in its body, it's just uh, a tube, um, uh, has all these genes, uh, while this, this proud little human uh, has, has lost a lot of genes and has, well, got a lot more, right? So this, this uh, process of gene loss is dominating on all kinds of timescales. Okay, and so again, what we uh, conclude is that uh, this seems to be a generic property of uh, biological, uh, biological evolution. Um, and we see it in many different models that I won't go into it. The nice thing of, about these models is also that they don't just show this one phenomenon. They show many phenomena that we all can um, compare with biological systems. And so two ways to say, okay, I have a, a model that tells me something that, that, yeah, that I trust is on the one hand to say other models do the same thing. On the other hand, all kinds of other observables on that model also fit our biological systems. Although we didn't have them in mind at all when we started our modeling. Okay, so what uh, I showed for the uh, example systems that I, I looked at is that, yes, we can work with simple models as long as we don't forget that they are, uh, well, inherently, we need this multi-level, uh, multi-levels of selection, the conflict between these multi-level selection or the tuning of these, uh, these multi-levels um, in order to get this feedback on the primary system to get this larger complexity. Okay, and as I said, uh, importantly, um, well, we don't go for models, um, well, one model who shows something all, all the time and then do uh, analysis of the, uh, well, when this happens and when that happens, because we see so often that these systems have multiple attractors and that one of the attractors, uh, well, just appears to be uh, immediately or after a long time, uh, better than the other, and that's the cases that we would expect to see in biological evolution. That's it. Oh, I have one, one last one. Uh, back to, to Darwin. And so this is another quote, which is actually never said by Darwin, but is often attributed to Darwin. It's not the most intellectual or the strongest of species that survives, but species that survives is the one that's able to adapt to and adjust best to the changing environment in which it finds itself. Um, that is something that well, somebody um, uh, got out of, of his writings. However, as I just said, um, this has been a kind of taboo in biology because these long-term uh, processes are being ignored. And indeed, we have to, well, they don't come out of the models when we don't put this multi-levelness uh, in nature in it. Okay, that's it. Okay. So, thank you so much, Pauline, for the amazing talk. Very inspiring, not only from only the biological point of view, but also for the also from the modeling modeling perspective. So, I think that we have much to learn from from it. So, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. If you have, if you have some. Okay, hold it. Uh, thank you for this is working here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, so I'm not super familiar with the field, so sorry if I'm imprecise, but I know there's a specific uh, speed that is sort of an optimum for the um, adaptation of a genome that is sort of inversely proportional to the length of the genome. Uh, uh, the mutation a... rate is inversely, uh, is, is directly dependent on the size of the, uh, of the genome because the mutation happens per gene or per uh, nucleotide. 
So when you get a larger uh, a genome, you have more mutations. And actually that has often been um, called as, as one of the important um, uh, problems in getting a more complex organism is a larger genome because you have all these mutations. And so these mutations can just deteriorate the whole system. And so, for example, in uh, genetic programming, people have uh, very often complained in, okay, we get these enormous, um, well, uh, long list functions. Um, however, the, in my uh, view, the mistake that they are making is that they have a mutation rate per genome instead of per, well, list per <laughs> atom or uh, whatever you call it. But so we see, well, we have worked with uh, genetic programming as well in our, our context. And then we see the same thing of genome expansion and then streamline. So again, a very other uh, encoding, however, the same kind of results. Is that what you were? What? Yes, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, time for just one last very quick question. Otherwise, we can move to the next keynote. Very quick. Okay. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, thank you. That's good. Thank you. <laughs>